please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Marie Chetta. It's really a delight to be here. And I can't believe all you people don't have better things to do. <laughs> but thank you so much for coming out. And I was approached just now by a local citizen of Irvine who said to me he had two pieces of advice, that I should have fun and also talk to you because I think you really need to know what I'm going to say is important. And I do think this is important because Stem cell biology is now the subject of politics and our national discourse. And I think as scientists, we are not very good at taking our science in a sophisticated way to a sophisticated citizenry. So I will try, as I go through things tonight, to tell you what the myth, realities, and surprises are. But you may make your own judgment about which they are. I'm going to start by talking about the differences between adult and embryonic stem cells, because I think this is a difficult area for people to understand. And I'm also then going to talk a little bit about last year's Nobel Prize, this year's Nobel Prize, in induced pluripotent stem cells, again, because what a landmark to have a stem cell Nobel Prize so quickly after the discovery of embryonic stem cells. And then I'm going to give you some case studies of stem cells that are in the clinic with varying degrees of success to try to give you an idea of what makes for a successful stem cell therapy and what makes for one that's a little slower to be successful. Normally, when I would give a talk to an audience this size, I would tell you to raise your hand, but I think that's not allowed. I promise you, you'll have time to ask questions at the end. So all of the technical things that I'm going to tell you, these are the things that I want you to take home tonight. We think of stem cells as being this magical thing that if we put them in a dish, they'll make an organ. Guess what? They're like children. And you have to get them to behave with a lot of effort. And what we've learned in the last 10 years is that effort has to come a lot from engineers and not from biologists. The most critical factors to me in getting this field to be mature and to make a difference in patients' lives are communication, communication, communication. And I will give you examples along the way of times when these kinds of communications have not happened. A big one for me, having lived in a liver transplant service for 25 years, is that the organ transplanters know a lot about what a good donor is, how to preserve an organ, and, and the immune response to different kinds of organs. And yet, the organ transplanters don't talk to the stem cell biologists, for example. But it's very important for you to be inspired at the end of tonight and to talk to your government to support science. So first, a definition. All stem cells, whether they're adult or embryonic, act depending on signals they receive to either make copies of themselves to self-renew or to go on and make a specialized daughter cell of more than one type. Now, I think the definition should also include that they can move around. And that's a problem when you think you're going to put them someplace and that they'll stay there. Also, this whole context-dependent choice of whether you make a copy of yourself or go on to differentiate into a specialized cell is mediated by the environment. It's mediated by things that are invisible to us, like gases and stress and flow. That's why we need engineers. And those kinds of signals are very poorly reflected in the laboratory environment in which we scientists grow our cells. So adult versus embryonic. There's advantages and disadvantages to each. To each. But one of the things that I think happened after 1998 when human embryonic stem cells were first reported is that people started to look for stem cells everywhere. And guess what? There are stem cells everywhere. There's five different stem cells in your tooth pulp, for example. And that's a good thing, because all of these are going to have a place somewhere along the way in our medical enterprises. So 
What are the big differences? Where they come from, of course, and I'll get to that in a minute. But adult stem cells, almost by definition, can only proliferate, replace themselves a finite number of times, especially in the lab conditions that are very artificial. Whereas embryonic stem cells grown under the right conditions in the laboratory can renew and renew and renew. We would grow the same line for year after year. Then the issue of potency, which I'll come to in a minute, is very different. But um, the idea that adult stem cells can come from any stage of development is something that people don't understand. You can get an adult stem cell from a fetal source, from an embryonic source, from a post-mortem 85-year-old. Embryonic stem cells come from generally unfertilized eggs, and we'll show you pictures of that. This issue of genomic instability, we really don't know if there's a difference or not. We think that with um, certain kinds of tumors, embryonic stem cells have a natural tendency to make all kinds of cells so they can make benign tumors under the right circumstances where there's less tumor potential in adult stem cells. But the big important issue for us is this issue of potency. So some kinds of stem cells can only make a few different kind of daughter cells, and they're called multipotent. Other kinds of stem cells, like blood stem cells, can make lots of different kinds of daughter cells, and they're called pluripotent. And at first, we called embryonic stem cells totipotent because under the right circumstances, you could, in theory, coax them to make any kind of cell in the body, including eggs and sperm. But we've backed away from that a little bit. Realizing this issue of guiding them is so problematic. So only the fertilized implanted egg is really totipotent because it's getting the right signals to make the kinds of cells that you want. And so we mostly call embryonic stem cells pluripotent now, being a little bit more modest as a field. So embryonic stem cells, uh, unlike the adult stem cells that I just told you about, all of the lines that are in common use, most of the lines that are in common use, came from fertilized eggs from in vitro fertilization clinics that would otherwise have been destroyed. And after about five days of growing the fertilized egg in the lab, the cells have um, basically two cell types. The outer part would, the trophoblast cells, if implanted, would become the placenta. The inner cells, and this is a fluid-filled ball, the inner cell mass, if implanted, would go on to become the fetus. And at the beginning of this science, the act of pulling these inner cell mass cells out to grow up embryonic stem cells destroyed these embryos. It's now possible to do this without destruction of the blastocyst. And this is a, a mouse embryonic stem cell um, line, and you can see these clusters of embryonic stem cells growing on a lawn of feeder layers. That's what they look like in the lab. When this uh, cell broke on the scene in 1998, boy, was there a lot of excitement, and boy, is it justified. So, of course, people thought you could make any kind of cell. We could replace us liver transplanters, make liver cells and do cell transplants instead. We could think about replacing cells for the various degenerative diseases and traumatic diseases. We can think about cancer survival. One of the other things that anyone who does developmental <clears throat> biology thought about is, wow, for the first time, we have a laboratory substratum for understanding toxicity to the developing early human. So for example, in my laboratory, we started putting little tiny bits of alcohol on embryonic stem cells in various stages of development to see what the effects on development were of alcohol levels that a woman who had a drink or two would see during her pregnancy. We never had a capacity to do those kinds of experiments before. So all of these things are happening, some with greater success than others. And embryonic stem cells were the star of that hope for quite some time until 2006 when Shinya Yamanaka came along and reported that he could make 
essentially embryonic stem cells from just about any other cell type. And this is what won the Nobel Prize. So he did experiments that, as I told my graduate students at the time, could only have been done in Japan. You would never get an American graduate student to do these st studies. He took the genes that are expressed in embryonic stem cells, but turned off when the cells go on to be a specialized cell, and put them inside a skin cell in various combinations. This huge combinatoric experiment. And he found a combination of four of them that, in a small percentage of the cells, would revert this skin cell back through developmental time to become an embryonic stem cell. And in fact, some of you may know that as you age, your chromosomes shorten. And guess what? These chromosomes got longer. Again, it reset the aging process, making the cells immortal, just like embryonic stem cells. This didn't happen at the sequence level. It happened at the level of control over which genes are expressed outside the sequence. The Nobel Prize was also awarded to John Gurdon last, this year. And there's a good reason for that. Because the process that happened that Yamanaka induced to turn a differentiated skin cell back to an embryonic stem cell is exactly what happens to the chromosomes at the time of fertilization. The egg cytoplasm changes the expression pattern of the chromosomes and makes them ready for early development. So 50 years ago was when all this work was done. And if it hadn't been done, I think the realization of what was going on with the induced pluripotent stem cells would have taken a lot longer. So again, this is not genetic manipulation, but you're making epigenetic changes. They're heritable, but not sequence dependent. Hard to understand. So this initiated a whole new kind of hope that I could take a skin cell from my friend Yoram sitting in the second row there, and he needed something to fix his macular degeneration, and I could make an embryonic stem cell from his skin cell, and then in induce those cells to make retinal pigment epithelium, which you'll see, see later, and give them back to him without him rejecting them. So all of a sudden, there was this idea that we could have personalized medicine from induced pluripotent stem cells. This has not come into the clinic yet, although induced pluripotent stem cells, I bet, will be in the clinic next year in just that kind of application. But it changed the whole way that we thought about the stability of, of cells developmentally. So other investigators, in this case, um, Marius Fernig from Stanford, took the same principles. They took transcription factors that are expressed in development to make nerve cells become nerve cells and put those into skin cells and went directly from skin cell to nerve cell, shortcutting the developmental circuits. And similarly, uh, Deepak Srivastava up at the Gladstone Institute in San Francisco did the same thing. He took the, the genes that are important in development for turning a cell into a beating cardiomyocyte, a heart muscle cell, put those inside a skin cell, and went directly to cardiac muscle. This is quite astonishing. Who thought we could do this until just a couple of years ago? So this is a major landmark in biology before it touches patients, because it really changes our ideas about the stability of cells. I also think that, again, we're going to have difficulties about our assumptions about perfect tolerance. So all those manipulations you do in a dish to get the cell from being skin to embryonic stem cell to whatever cell you want are probably going to result in the expression of proteins that you didn't see during normal development. So maybe this immune tolerance won't be perfect, but it'll still be pretty good. And the other major impact of these cells is that stem cell biology now has a reach in to drug development in ways that we never could have anticipated. So for example, you can take a skin cell from a patient with Alzheimer's disease and put them back into embryonic stem cell state, make a neuron, and develop a disease in a dish model where 
the neurons that you create will accumulate all those terrible tau proteins and tangles that happen in Alzheimer's patients. And then you could screen a bunch of drugs to see what clears this. We never thought we'd have reach in here. So there's lots of good examples uh, of disease in a dish being important for drug development because of the work of this Nobel Prize. So we're now kind of scratching our heads about whether this iPS cells will replace embryonic stem cells as the next great thing. Um, so far, there's only been two clinical applications in clinical trials of embryonic stem cells, and I'll tell you a little bit about both of them, both California-based. The first to get clearance for, by, from FDA for a clinical trial was Geron in Menlo Park, and they took their embryonic stem cells. These are embryonic stem cells, just like I told you about at the beginning, from uh, blastocyst embryos and push them to differentiate into a cell that is responsible for insulating neurons, oligodendrocytes. And they put these pa uh, cells into patients with acute thoracic spinal cord injuries. I think five patients were injected. There was apparently no safety issues. No efficacy has been reported. The company closed the program. The company closed their entire stem cell unit um, ostensibly for financial reasons. Whether this will be restarted or not is a good question, but their stem cell portfolio has recently been purchased by another company with experience in developing stem cells, so we may see that come back again. The other company, ACT, is making these retinal pigment epithelial cells for patients with macular degeneration. Um, and uh, quite a number of patients have been injected already with some hint that there is efficacy as well as safety. Um, and so we'll see that play out. And I'm going to come back to this particular clinical trial later because I will try to make the case that the eye is the best place to test out a lot of these therapies. So that's the hot things that got people talking about stem cells. But let's go back now to the history of stem cells in the clinic, actually in the clinic. When you get a bone marrow transplant, and bone marrow transplants have been a relatively common procedure for almost half a century, you're getting a blood stem cell transplant. Bone marrow transplants are blood stem cell transplants. And so you're getting the cells that are responsible for making your red blood cells throughout your life, your platelets throughout your life, and all the different wonderful kinds of T cells and B cells. <laughs> Um, and recently, cord blood has been used instead of marrow for lots of indications, especially for children who need a blood stem cell transplant. And, and this is just increasing a lot. In, uh, there's at least 10,000 transplants been done with cord blood for mostly blood tumor disorders. So 50 years of clinical adult stem cell transplant, that's the reason why an organization like AABB thinks it has something to say about cell therapies in general and why I went to AABB. So yes, there have been thousands and thousands of lives saved with blood stem cell transplants. But the bad news was that those of us in other areas of stem cell biology really thought we had an easy time of it, that if we just injected our stem cells IV, they'd find their place to the right home where they normally live and do their thing. Well, guess what? That doesn't happen. So we really had this magical idea, I think, 12 years, 14 years ago, that if you just put the cells in, they would do it all. And that is the exception to the rule. So there's very few mini organs that can be developed in a dish. The few stem cells that can do that are uh, gut stem cells, kidney stem cells. I'll show you that in a minute. And interestingly, uh, embryonic stem cells or parthenogenetic stem cells that seem to be able to generate little corneas in a dish. So here's an example of something that can be engineered as a mini organ in a dish. This is a little 
little tiny kidney making urine. There's about 40 different cell types in the kidneys. So the fact that the group at Wake Forest and Tengion has been able to do this is amazing. Um, the most, the, the big problem that they're going to face now is scaling this up. This is really minuscule compared to the amount of <coughs> kidney that you would need to do anything significant in a human. But most of the time when we grow cells in the lab, they just kind of randomly do their thing. So here's a picture of neurons in red and oligodendrocytes, those cells that ensheath neurons in green. In my lab, we grew, and we grew these from embryonic stem cells, human embryonic stem cells. Well, it's very pretty. It looks like a galaxy, but you wouldn't want that to be the wiring of your brain. And similarly, these are muscle stem cells that we grew up in our lab. And uh, as you know, muscle to function as a contractile unit is a, has got thousands of nuclei in a single fiber. And when you grow these up in the lab, they kind of fuse together, but they make all kinds of shapes that really wouldn't do you much good as muscle. That's the common thing that you see. So this is why we need engineers. And the engineers have come in at every scale that you can think of. So here's an example at the single cell or few cell level, where a stem cell that can either become a smooth muscle or a cartilage, if the culture is, if the single cell is held in a round shape, it will go in one direction. If it's allowed to flatten out, it will go in the other direction. And Chris Chen at Penn and others have shown that just changing the cell shape initiates a whole series of signals from the outside to the inside of the cell that are transduced um, into chemical signals and will change the whole differentiation pattern of the cell. That's pretty amazing. Karen Chrisman took, at UCSD took it to the next level where she said, hmm, the cells are influenced by the extracellular material around them. And she takes the cells away from an organ system, grinds up the proteins in that matrix around the cells, and uses them to influence the cell behavior. And pretty much in any organ she's touched, these hydrogels, which she calls, which are injectable, have very potent effects on their own. And so, for example, in the heart, the hydrogel from the matrix of the heart, no cells, is as potent in helping some forms of heart attack in animal models as stem cells are themselves. And so she's taking this into um, a commercial venture. On a larger scale, other investigators have decided, let's just take that whole matrix in the shape that it exists in the body. And so what you see is Doris Taylor's hands holding a decellularized rat heart. All the cells are gone, but that fine structure on which they normally attach is still there. And sure enough, if she puts cells on this structure and puts them in a bioreactor, they will go into a nice arrangement. They will contract in a meaningful way. Just this little skeleton is enough to signal the cells to go to the right place. Even more amazing was when this was done in lung, in Laura Nicholson's lab at Yale. Laura is also an anesthesiologist. And she decellularized lung, which has a very, very fine tissue paper matrix. And then um, put cells back on this decellularized lung. And again, something like 30 different cell types just because of the surface tension, just because of the thickness of that matrix, they pretty much found their way to the right place. And it's hard to tell the difference, really, between a native lung and one that was reconstituted from this decellularized skeleton. So this is going to be a very important feature of stem cell biology. It's why we need the engineers. So many engineers have gone and examined just what it is that the shape and Young's modulus and all these other features that they can measure quantitatively are in different organ systems to help us create many organs in a dish that, when, that then we can transplant rather than just transplanting suspensions of cells. And this has certainly come into the clinic in wound healing. 
where the tension on wounds can be measured by engineers and known to affect the migration of cells into the wound to heal the wound. Um, and one of the leaders in this area is Jennifer Alessia at Hopkins. So here's an example that I thought was a really interesting one to follow. Um, Paolo Macchiarini is a surgeon from Italy who's now at the Karolinska Institute teaching other people how to make artificial tracheas. When he started, he um, took trachea from a cadaveric source and decellularized it just like you saw with the heart and lung and seeded this decellularized trachea with the patient's own, the recipient's own cells from a biopsy specimen and then put it in a bioreactor and developed conditions to seed this and implant it so that it was all coated on the right surfaces with the right kinds of cells. And then it was transplanted into a patient and worked very, very well. Other investigators at the same time got even more elaborate. They thought, oh, this trachea is going to have to have, in addition to the normal cells that are sitting on it, it's going to have to have a blood supply. So after making the trachea and seeding it, they put it in the arm of the recipient to have a blood supply grow in and then transplanted it into the patient. And this was very elegant using the body as the bioreactor, and it also worked well. But over time, what Dr. Macchiarini has found is that when he does these transplants and biopsies them to see what their health is, and he distinguishes between the donor and the host cells, he's getting a lot of host cells coming in. And so what's happened now is you don't even need the cells anymore. If you engineer the structure with the right surface tensions, the right shape, the, you can transplant in a completely synthetic trachea and the host cells will come in over time and populate it. So this has been a very important lesson for us to get in there with stem cell-based therapies to really understand where we need stem cells and where we might not. So this field really needs a lot of calculated risk by pioneers and reminds me very much of where we were in liver transplant 25 years ago when Starzl was pushing and doing transplants before the field was really ready. And there are investigators like that now. The first example I have up here is, is Steve Badalak's lab. Steve is at Pitt. And he uses matrix again, no cells, this time from gut as a source of growth signals and was able to regrow an entire tip. That's a pretty complex structure of a finger. Um, using just that matrix material. This work was funded um, in large part by our Department of Defense, and I have to say that our Department of Defense has been a big promoter of regenerative medicine um, because we, of the battlefield injuries of soldiers. Now, as Steve will tell you, that doesn't look like much, but if you have nothing and you have a little hook to do things, that's a big deal. Another example that's not quite so successful is what you're seeing here is a bladder. And this is a bladder that was made in a, as, on a collagen, engineered collagen matrix, seeded with the patient's own bladder cells. And then when it was implanted in patients, the omentum of vascular structure inside of, on the top of your abdomen was pulled down um, to vascularize the bladder. This went through phase one in patients, but failed in phase two, largely because I, I think, well, you know, although I haven't had this conversation with the investigators, um, but I think it just couldn't be standardized. And when the surgeons handed it off to industry, it just it couldn't be repeated very easily. And this is where um, standards and comparative studies that we're trying to do at AABB I think will be really important. This will get there someday, but it got slowed down. Another place where I think we're there's been a lot in the newspapers, but we should know tons more than we do, is this whole area of stem cells used to treat heart attacks. So just about any kind of cell that you can think of has been used. Skeletal muscle myoblasts from your muscle outside of your heart, these mesenchymal stem cells um, from marrow or fat, all kinds of cells from marrow mixed up, and 
car true cardiac stem cells, as well as, um, not in patients yet, but embryonic stem cells used to make cardiomyocytes. And in addition to this plethora of cell types, various sites of delivery have been used, various doses, various times after the injury, um, and nobody really had an incentive because they were doing their own thing to compare one cell to the other. And there's an awful lot of this work going on, especially offshore. And so early on, comparative efficacy studies were not done. Fame and fortune kind of got in the way. And so what do we really know after thousands of reports? We know that the effects of cells other than the true cardiac stem cells are pretty modest. Patients probably were not hurt, but a lot of them probably were not helped. And the effects are not permanent. So we got a hint that there was something there. Um, but we should have known this many years ago with all the thousands of patients that were treated. And now it's, what's becoming clearer is that the true cardiac stem cells in which investigators go in and biopsy part of the heart, grow it out, and then re-implant into the same patient, those are having big effects. And they're having big effects on heart function, but they're also remodeling scar. They're taking scar tissue and turning it into muscle. They're actually truly regenerating. So I gave you two sort of not so successful stories. Again, the heart story will get there. But I'm going to tell you what I think is the most successful adult stem cell story out there. And it's completely under the radar. You don't read about this in the newspapers at all. And these are called the limbal stem cells of the cornea. These treatments are for patients mostly who get chemical or thermal burns. So because of good OSHA safety rules in the US, we don't have a lot of these patients. But there's many centers in the US that still do this transplant in low numbers. But in India and in other places, you can imagine, there's a fair amount of business. So if the injury is unilateral, the surgeons can go in and take a very small biopsy from this area of the eye called the limbus, grow the cells up, and then re-implant them into the sister eye. It can also be done from a third-party donor, where um, the cells, again, are biopsied from the eye. And, and I think even post-mortem, and then the cells are grown up and transplanted back. Those patients need a little bit of immunosuppression. So this field really got regenerated a couple years ago by a beautiful paper in the New England Journal that came out of a group in Italy and showed that these horrible lesions, horrible lesions, the vast majority of them could be um, cured, but also permanently, because you are reconstituting the stem cell population in the eye. And the cure not only restores vision, but you all know that when you just scratch your eye a tiny little bit, it hurts like hell. Can you imagine what this must feel like? And so the cure was not only restoration of vision and making the cornea transparent again, but also relief of pain. So to me, this is a remarkable success story in adult stem cell therapy that nobody knows about. And we should learn from this. So um, again, this is a field that has been driven only by single center reports. No one has a comparative database. No one really knows from center to center what they're doing, except for when they feel like they want to be generous about sharing that kind of data. And so in addition to establishing standards to keep this successful field from falling apart, as many low volume surgeries will, because they're subject to process error. We're working with the various um, eye associations, American Academy of Ophthalmology and ARVO and others, and the Department of Defense, to develop standards for this so that the investigators can talk to each other and that their progress can be faster. And we hope, ultimately, to also get a database of these patients so that you can look at your practice and pick out the variables that lead to good outcome and not so good outcome in patients and have that be a worldwide um, effort. And so far, we've been greeted enthusiastically by the eye doctors. So I'm concentrating on good stories at the end. Limbal stem cells are a great story. Another big surprise 
is the use of blood stem cells to treat non-blood diseases. So here's an example of a little boy who has a terrible disease called epidermolysis bullosa. It's a defect in collagen, and so the skin has no integrity. They have wounds, they get skin cancer. It's actually terribly painful, and the children don't live very long. Um, John Wagner was the first at Minnesota to do a bone marrow transplant for these kids, and that alone replaces enough collagen in them that it really changes the course of their disease quite dramatically. The other nice surprise that's happening all across stem cell biology, but I think particularly in blood stem cells, is that there's a revival of gene therapy. So you can imagine that stem cells from patients with a genetic defect could be modified and then given back to them if their gene, genes were modified. And there's a, a quite large effort to transfect in the receptor that doesn't allow the AIDS virus to enter blood cells and then give those stem cells back to patients as a potential cure for AIDS, which came from a proof of principle case report out of Germany a couple years ago. So the gene therapy, which kind of died uh, um, when there was a terrible procedural issue at Penn uh, quite a while ago, is really being revived by stem cell biology and vice versa. I think that the two will really help each other out. So another surprise was that mesenchymal stem cells, which all of us have in quite some abundance, um, guess what? Instead of causing an immune response, if you get one of these cells from somebody else, they actually modify the immune response and turn it down. The details are just emerging, but the change of these cells in turning down the inflammatory and immune responses is quite profound. And so they're being applied in clinical trials for a variety of diseases where the inflammatory component of the disease is a big part of the pathogenesis. So multiple sclerosis, type 1 diabetes, arthritis, Crohn's disease, heart attack, macular degeneration, you name it. There's clinical trials using these cells. So far, quite safe. Efficacy variable, depending on the disease. But these will definitely become part of our clinical armamentarium um, in very short time. So I mentioned to you early on that if things could get rolled out in an ideal way, we wouldn't start by giving stem cells to the brain. We'd start by using a more optimal stem cell target, and that's the eye. Now, I already told you about the success of the stem cells on the surface of the eye, but the real action, I think, is happening right now in the retina. So those of us over 50 know very well that we're at high risk of macular degeneration. It's a terrible common disease in which you lose your central vision. Why is the eye such a great target? Well, um, the surgeons can actually see inside the eye after they've done their graft transplant. So you put cells inside a spinal cord, you put cells inside a brain, it's a black box after that. Also, the small graft size is important. If you want to make a whole liver, you need to scale up a huge amount of cells, whereas 50,000, 150,000 cells to treat macular degeneration will probably do the trick. The eye is also relatively immune privileged, meaning the immune system won't go on full attack, and also turns out to be really easy to make one of the cell types that's affected in macular degeneration. And if worse came to worse, if you had a stem cell therapy that caused a tumor in your brain or your spinal cord, it would be nearly impossible to treat that. But if worse came to worse, you could enucleate the eye. So as I said to you, the retinal pigment epithelial cells, which are not functioning quite right um, in macular degeneration, are easy to make. So unlike some kinds of neurons that take seven months and lots of manipulations to make, these cells are pretty easy to make. And in fact, when I first read the protocol, um, for making these from embryonic stem cells, I got the feeling that they discovered it because they left the dish in the back of the incubator and forgot about it. So 
Anyway, so th this will also, these retinal pigment epithelial cells, will be the first use of those Nobel Prize winning iPS cells because, again, there wasn't a good business model for making an embryonic stem cell and then turning it into something else. That would be a very expensive process. But if you only have to make a few cells, um, like RPE, this could happen. And so the Japanese are in the process of moving this therapy based on induced pluripotent stem cells to the clinic. But again, structure comes into it. And here we have the chance in living experiments to compare taking retinal pigment epithelial cells in suspension and injecting them into the right place of the eye versus doing something more elaborate to engineer. So the group ACT that is in clinical trials right now is just putting the cells in suspension into the subretinal space. But you can see this gorgeous architecture of the normal retina. The retinal pigment epithelial cells here face the photoreceptors. Remember your rods and cones from high school biology? That's rods and cones. And these guys clean up these rods and cones. That's their function. They make them survive. They clean them up. And if they're not right there, they can't really do their job. And so there is a group based at uh, USC, UCSB, and Caltech that has developed a membrane, uh, artificial membrane that is similar in its structure to the membrane that the retinal pigment epithelial cells normally sit on. And their plan is, instead of just injecting a suspension of these cells, to put them as a little patch graft onto the macula in a surgical procedure. So we'll be able to compare whether the engineered strategy versus relying on the cells in a diseased environment to find their right place um, and do their business is a better strategy. So here's the biggest myth of all. The whole picture in macular degeneration is not recapitulated in an animal model. And this is a, you might say, a relatively simple disease. But guess what? There's no good animal model for just about any complex disease. And so we do a lot of curing of animal models of diseases with stem cells and with drugs that do not carry over, unfortunately, into the clinic. But nonetheless, I think that macular degeneration and the variety of stem cells now being planned and actually in clinical trial for patients is a really good chance for us to understand a little bit more about the relative value of an anti-inflammatory approach, a suspension approach, a sheet approach, a combined cell approach in a very common disease for which there's huge unmet medical need. And then remember when I showed you this gorgeous structure of the retina? The retina developmentally is really a mini brain. And these studies will also tell us about the capacity of various kinds of stem cells to integrate properly into their location, to rewire. And that's going to be important lessons for the stem cells being put into the brain. So I, I hope that what you are left with is that all of these approaches, and I know I've covered a lot of material, but a million different kinds of adult stem cells, um, with and without engineered structures, autologous, allogeneic, from someone else, from yourself, pluripotent stem cells, are all going to, a, to play a place in regenerative medicine. And now it's just a matter of sorting out what the right cell is for the right application. So there's been, in the last 10 years, some really surprising successes. And there's been some really disappointing failures, but it's now time for this, the field to step back a little bit and really try to learn from both of those scenarios. And from my perspective, the position from which you learn is remembering that we're all trying to take care of patients. So this is a very complex enterprise. It goes from discovery in academic medical centers through all kinds of animal studies and toxicology studies and transfer to industry and regulatory problems and patent problems and clinical trial design and all of it very complicated 
by other constraints around the stem cell field. At AABB, we think that standardizing these processes, really putting quality systems across stem cell biology the way the quality systems have preserved the blood, safety of the blood supply for the last 65 years, is the way to keep a focus on the patients and to keep a focus on safety and to make all of these complicated processes go faster. And this is happening to us in all of medicine now. So this is just the newsletter from November that I get as an anesthesiologist talking about how you get quality systems in anesthesiology. Every field of medicine is having to do this. Wouldn't it be great if regenerative medicine does it early enough in its history to take a leadership position in standardizing complex therapies for patients. Thank you very much. Thank you.